Gödel's first incompleteness theorem from 1931. He showed that there's a sentence in mathematics that's such that if the system is consistent, that sentence is not a theorem, nor is it not a theorem. So what it means is, there's a blind spot, if you like. There's a sentence in mathematics that just cannot be derived either way from mathematics. If it's consistent. If it's not consistent, then fine. All bets are off, but that's bad news for another reason, right? So, just to give you a sense of what this sentence is like, very, very... Uh, again, I, unfortunately, I can't go into the details for reasons of time, but uh, ingenious way he, he coded this stuff up. He made a way of coding up every sentence of mathematics and giving them sort of numerical values for all of the propositions of mathematics. Incredibly non-trivial, used for all sorts of reasons, all over the place in computing mathematics elsewhere. Very ingenious. Often skipped over as... Oh, yeah, of course, you just give a name to everything. But you've got infinitely many of them. You've got to be very careful about how you assign the names. Devilishly clever what Gödel did here. But that was just sort of one of the, the technical language he needed to get this up. But once you've done all that, and here I'll just wave my hands like everyone else. <laughs> once we've done all that devilishly clever stuff, you've just got a sentence of the form, I am not provable. OK, now just think about that sentence. And you can, again, think back to the liar paradox, right? Gödel also, you know, philosophers are not alone in kind of worrying about such things. Gödel also worried about the liar, and this is where this came from, thinking about the liar paradox. I am not provable, okay? Think things through here. What if it's provable? Well, then it must be false, because it says it's not provable. So that's an inconsistency in the system. So if you can derive that sentence, if you can prove that sentence, your system's inconsistent. On the other hand, what if it's not provable? Well, then what it says is true. It's clearly true, but not provable. That's the only option left standing here, right? This sentence is true, but not provable in the system, if the system is consistent. Again, this makes it... So, as, as I said at the outset, the basic idea of Gödel's is very, very simple. You know, this is the core idea. A lot of details to get this to work and the enco girdle encoding and, and so on and so forth, but the basic idea is just ingenious. Just, you know, he'd been thinking about the liar paradox far too long. You know, <laughs> far too long for it to be healthy. Now, this is a problem for Hilbert, right? Because Hilbert thought that you could be able to recapture all of mathematics by playing this formal game, where the formal game is just manipulating symbols via rules. What Gödel showed is that there'll be blind spots. You're going to miss bits. If that's what mathematics is, it's going to miss things. That's bad for Hilbert, but Hilbert might shrug his shoulders and say, yeah, but that's bad for everybody. Okay. Um, second problem for, for Hilbert. Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. He showed that uh, no consistent system can prove its own consistency. Modulo a few little uh, caveats here and there, but we won't need to go into the details. No consistent theory with a certain amount of mathematics, a certain amount of arithmetic, can prove its own consistency. This is absolutely devastating blow. Because again, remember what was happening at the time. We've got this crisis in mathematics... Mathematics had been proven to be inconsistent. Shock, shock waves went throughout all of mathematics and anyone who used mathematics. This was devastating. We never want this to happen again, was the, sort of the mantra. Working out new theories in ways that would never have these sorts of inconsistencies. But no one was completely confident because they, they thought that the original theory was fine until Russell came along as well. That looked like everything was hunky-dory there, but it wasn't. So they... While they were hoping that ZFC, the new theory, was consistent, no one was sure. And what you would really want is a proof that it's consistent. What Gödel showed is, ain't no such animal. There are no consistency proofs. Unless it's inconsistent. Then you can have it. But then it's kind of worthless, right? <laughs> so, the basic idea, uh, I won't dwell on this, but the basic idea is, 
if T is consistent, then G is not derivable in T. So T is just your mathematical theory. If this theory is consistent, then G, which is our girdle sentence from before, right, the sentence that just says, I'm not derivable, then G is not derivable in T. And you can show, I won't bother with it, it's, it's, it's leave it as a homework exercise, if you like, that given the previous incompleteness theorem, uh, if you could have a consistency proof of T, then you'd be able to derive the girdle sentence. But we've already shown that you cannot derive the girdle sentence. So you can't have a consistency proof. So the significance of the results, I think, uh, for mathematics alone and, and logic alone, what do we do about these results of girdles? Well, unlike the, the crisis in the foundations uh, in relation to the inconsistency that had been proven by Russell, that had to be fixed, right? You, you can't keep going with mathematics when it's inconsistent. I mean, amazingly, a great deal of mathematics, it was business as usual because it was a crisis in set theory. And insofar as you thought the rest of mathematics was just you know, set theory in sheep's clothing, then, you know, we're in trouble. But that's not to say that you can't continue working in mathematics. Uh, think of crises in other branches of science. You might have a crisis in quantum mechanics, as arguably we do at the moment. Interpretation of quantum mechanics is deeply problematic. Does that mean ecologists should shut up shop until quantum physicists get things sorted out? No. Business is usually in, in, in ecology and elsewhere. And so for mathematics, a lot of mathematics went by business as usual, but you know, there were beads of sweat on their brow, I think, for fair to say, for 20 or 30 years. Uh, so in, in, whereas the Gödel results, these are not kind of things that need to be fixed. These are just facts about the systems. This is just a fact about mathematics. It will have blind spots. You cannot derive the consistency of a system that's rich enough to have mathematics in it within the system. You cannot derive every truth of the system. There will be these blind spots. What are you going to do about it? Live with it. That's why it's such a sort of startling result. These are mathematical theorems about mathematics, or as we're often called now, metamathematical theorems, about sort of a layer, a, a, a layer above mathematics. And we just have to come to terms with them. So they're very, very important about very, very important implications for all sorts of places, like you know, mathematics and logic, obviously, but also for computing. If you think about what a computer is, well, a computer is a kind of program machine to crank through a bunch of rules, right? What can computers do? Well, insofar as the computer is an a, 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 a instantiation of a girdle system, there'll be blind spots. Okay, so this led some people to think that okay, these results aren't just mathematical results now then. They lead to important, important insights into nature of computation, nature of machine thinking, and you can feel it coming. Is there a difference between human thinking and machine thinking? So let me just run quickly through an argument that has got a lot of press, I think. And perhaps one of the reasons that Gödel's results are, uh, are as famous as they are is the significance of these results, if any, for uh, understanding the human mind. So Gödel, in effect, showed that there are blind spots in mathematics, unprovable truths. But the truth of the Gödel sentence, remember the Gödel sentence, this sentence is unprovable, the truth of that's plain to see. Everybody in the room can see that that's true. Right? It took us a couple of minutes to think our way through it, but it's clear that that sentence is, must be true. So there's a true sentence that's not derivable for within mathematics. So it's a blind spot by any kind of algorithmic computational system like mathematics or like a machine, but we humans can see it plain as day. It's true. So it looks like, uh, and I'm not endorsing this line of thought, but it's a very natural line of thought, it looks like there's something fundamentally different, to, different between the way humans think about these things and the way that machines think. You know, 
not surprising, you might, you might suggest, but very, very popular view is that a human brain is just a kind of fancy computer made of, you know, meat instead of silicon. That's all, you know. That it's just a fancy computer. And this line of thought suggests, well, no, it looks like there's something fundamentally different about machine thinking, which has these girdled blind spots, if you like, whereas the very blind spots that have been demonstrated, at least, are not blind spots at all to a human. So does this tell us something deep and interesting about the difference between, say, computers and human minds? Uh, I, I don't think so, but it's a, it's a fascinating thought, and it's worth sort of dwelling on, thinking about that for a moment, what the Gödel result really shows, and whether that does tell us something different about humans and machines. Why, if I can just say briefly why I don't think it tells us anything terribly uh, important about the differences is, well, on one hand, it's utterly unsurprising that we're not working like a kind of machine that Gödel had in mind, because for a start, we use probabilistic reasoning. We use hunches. We use, it's plain to see. I don't need a proof that there are people in this room, despite you know, what various philosophers have said throughout history. Uh, I don't need a proof of that. Why? Because I can just see it. I haven't, got a, I haven't got a proof of that in terms of mathematical proof. It's just plain to see. Okay? And we humans use it's plain to see, probabilistic reasoning, hunches, gut feelings, all sorts of things in our reasoning. And to be quite honest, we don't always distinguish between these different kinds of reasoning. When you're doing something a little bit more rigorous, like in a, uh, a logic paper, which you rarely carry outside of the logic classroom, uh, when you're doing that sort of reasoning, elsewhere you might, you know, you read an editorial of a newspaper, for instance, there'll be a bit of deductive re reasoning, like you might see in a logic class, a bit of probabilistic, a bit of gut feeling, a bit of a whole bunch of stuff, and not distinguished, just all sort of mixed in. So in a way, it's not surprising that humans are not like machines. But that's not what the claim is. The claim is that they can't be. You know, if you tried to model a human mind like this, it, it, it just doesn't have the blind spot. So what is it about the human mind? It's almost mysterious, right? There's something mysterious about the human mind that it doesn't have the blind spots the machine has. Well, here's the kind of simple answer, I think. Firstly, it's not surprising because we, we, we're a complicated... If we're a computer at all, you know, that lump of meat is a complicated lump of meat and it does some extraordinary range of things and an extraordinary variety of reasoning that goes on, all mish mishmashed together. Gödel's result just doesn't apply to such things. So not surprising that it doesn't have the blind spots at least. But here's a kind of more interesting answer, I think, is that what the Gödel result shows is that on the assumption that the system is consistent, there will be these blind spots. It doesn't say that there are blind spots, blind spots simpliciter, just that if the system is consistent, there will be blind spots. So when, you, when I said to you, but it's plain to see, right? This sentence is unprovable. Is plain to see, I said. What I actually smuggled in there with the plain to see was that and everything you believe is consistent. Your system is consistent. How plausible is that? Not at all, right? <laughs> we all have inconsistent beliefs about all sorts of things, right? I, I, I invite you to sort of think about your own belief systems. And I don't mean in sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, ways that you should be chastised for. All sorts of, you know, when you're in the logic classroom, you think such and such. When you step outside the logic classroom, you believe something slightly differently. Uh, we all have inconsistent beliefs about the city we live in, okay? I know my local neighbourhood, and I have a kind of mental map of that local neighbourhood, and I have a mental map of another neighbourhood nearby. Those maps overlap. Very, very common phenomenon is to think that, you know, such and such a street runs north-south, because it's roughly north-south, and then over here I'm thinking about that very same street, but not realising that it's the same street, thinking that it runs more or less east-west, for instance. It's very, very common mistakes people make by having local maps of their city and they've got inconsistencies in the overlap of those maps. Utterly implausible that any of us have consistent beliefs. In fact, if you do, you know, come and talk to me later because you deserve a medal. You really do. 
So what I did when I said it's plain to see was actually smuggle in a really, really heavy duty and false assumption that the system is consistent. Okay, that's just utterly implausible. And indeed, it's implausible for very good reasons for which Gödel pointed out to us. You cannot prove the consistency of the system. So in effect, what I've done is not just smuggle in the consistency of the system, but it's known to you that the system is consistent. You know no such thing. Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, in a way, ensures that that can't be the case. Still, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? <laughs> there is this fundamental difference between minds and machines. I'll finish off now with just, uh, just leaving the incompleteness stuff aside, and I just want to say a couple of things about... Uh, one of the lesser known results of Gödel, but I think it's one of my favourites, I just think it shows how quirky the guy was. So this is Gödel and Einstein, regular walking partners at, at uh, uh, Princeton in the 1950s. And no doubt over various conversations with Einstein, Gödel came up to speed. He was a smart guy, right? He didn't really work in mathematical physics, but he was a smart guy. And he came up to speed on general relativity. Came up to speed, actually a little bit more than up to speed. Came up to speed to the point where he could publish in the area. And published a startling result. So he found that there's this really odd model of Einstein's equations. So Einstein's equations are the equations that describe the, the way space-time is. Or the way it could be. The details are going to depend on the distribution of matter and the like, but... These are the big global constraints, if you like, how space-time is structured. And what Gödel showed was that there were these really odd solutions that no one could have been looking for because they were looking for solutions for the most part that looked something like the universe we live in. And what Gödel found were these really kind of odd solutions, but basically a big rotating disk, a universe that's a big rotating disk. And he found that in such a universe there were closed time-like world lines. Okay. What that means is a world line is just a sort of a trajectory of the particle through space-time. Okay. Closed means it comes back on itself. Right? World lines, you know, if you think about my world line, it sort of started in some place, I moved around in space, and as time went by, I moved. So I've got this kind of trajectory. What a closed time-like world line looks like is a world line that comes back on itself in the, space, in the temporal dimension. In a word, time travel. It's a kind of time travel. If, if space-time has the right kind of structure and you're cunning enough to sort of shoot a rocket in the right sort of direction, you can come back on yourself at an earlier time. You know, just, from, just for a moment, just sort of think about the kind of mind that, you know, he's working in mathematical logic and just over a conversation with Einstein comes up to speed on general relativity and thinks, ah, what about the big giant rotating disk with world lines that come back on themselves? Extraordinary, extraordinary sort of chain of thought. Why is this interesting? Well, it's actually, it's very important philosophically because various arguments people have put forward to suggest that time travel is logically impossible. You often hear that said in philosophical circles. There are logical paradoxes if you have time travel. You go back and kill yourself as a baby, for instance, before you got old enough to build a time machine to do the going back and doing the killing, and you've got this paradox, then did you do the killing or did you not? So-called grandfather paradox. It usually involves slaughtering a grandfather, but you can make, it, make the circle tighter by just doing it to yourself. Auto-infanticide is the technical term in philosophy. <laughs> Uh, and that's supposed to show, according to some, that time travel is logically impossible. It gives rise to a logical paradox. Well, what about I Gödel's solution to the Einstein equations? He's shown that it's actually consistent with our best physical theory, consistent with general relativity, that there are closed time-like world lines. These are not just logical possibilities. These are physical possibilities. That's much stronger. So, not to say that we do live in such a universe. The claim was never that just that it's certainly physically possible that we could live in such a universe. It's consistent with Einstein's theory, and if we did live in such a universe, there would be these trajectories. So, 
It puts pressure on those who think that time travel is logically impossible. You still might defend that view and say what's going wrong, wrong in the Gödel uh, cases, but a very, very interesting line of thought of, of, of Gödel's. And I think I might leave it there. That's a good place to sp finish. I really just wanted to mostly focus on the incompleteness results, which are what he's deservedly famous for. And not famous enough in my books, but, you know, yeah, of course I would say that. Uh, but this last little bit is just to give you an idea of sort of the, the, the quirkiness and, and the broad-ranging interests he had, you know, to, to actually think about this in, you know, in 1950s, be on top of general relativity enough to publish in respected physics journals. You know, most physicists would be pretty pleased to be able to do that. And here's someone who's dabbling, really. He's a mathematical logician. This is way, way from his normal work. And he's you know, up to speed on general rel relativity. Not just up to speed on it, as I said, but up to speed enough to see really quirky and weird results that had uh, bypassed everybody else. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.